break down, I, and I mean, you've touched on it a little bit. Why, why is communication so important for everybody to embrace? Why put in the effort? Yeah, man. Look, I mean, com- without communication, not only can we not manifest an idea into reality, right? For example, Einstein could have had all of his amazing you know, genius understandings of the mechanics of the universe. But if he couldn't communicate those ideas, it wouldn't have amounted to anything at all, you know. So communication is the the vehicle to manifest things into reality. But communication also is the conduit for us to um, be able to do anything together. And we need each other. Here's the million dollar question. How do men like us reach our full potential and grow into the men we dream of being while taking care of our responsibilities, working, being good husbands, fathers, and still take care of ourselves? That's the question. This podcast will help you with those answers. My name is Brent, and welcome to the Fallible Man Podcast. Welcome to the Fallible Man Podcast, your home for all things man, husband, and father. Big shout out to the Fallible Nation that makes all things like this possible, and welcome to our first-time listeners. Thank you for choosing to share your time with us and honoring us with that attention. We'll try and give you something worthwhile. Be sure and stick around and get to know us a bit. My name is Brent, and today my special guest is Jim Fuller, author, coach, TEDx speaker, and so, so, so much more. Jim, welcome to the Fallible Man podcast. Hey, Brent. Thanks for having me on. Now, Jim, I uh, just let me let me say right off the bat for my audience, I want them to hear this. I read a lot of books for my podcast. And your book was absolutely excellent. I consider myself a pretty decent communicator. Although I'm sure my wife will get a chuckle out of that portion of the show. I, I have post-it notes all through your book and just notes with lines on them. So I can go back and re-look at certain sections of the book because I think there's just so much value to the content you put together. There was so much worth my time and I had to just keep adding more notes and going back. So it's been added to the library on my website for all of my regular listeners. You guys know I have a library page on my website. You can find a link to Jim's book there, as well as in the show notes and in the description of this. But Jim, you wrote a phenomenal book. Wow. Wow, man. Thank you. You have just completely made my day. It's the start of the day over here in Australia. uh, And today is a great day. And (laughs) you've just set it up. Amazing, man. Thank you so much. I didn't write it as a a calling card. I I wrote the book because I'm hoping that, that it lands and that it helps provide strategies for people. So to hear your feedback um, really fills me up completely, man. Thank you so much. Now, Jim, I don't do huge introductions. And I know maybe that sounded more like an introduction, but I get to research all my guests and accolades don't mean anything to an audience that doesn't know you. So in your own words, who is Jim Fuller? Yeah, wow, what a great question. Um, And it can be so deep, can't it, that question? Look, I I see myself um, essentially as a kind, generous, caring, loving, action-taking man. That's who I see myself as. Um, And then the next layer out from that is a father. I've got two teenage boys, 18 and 16, and a partner, a, a gorgeous, beautiful, conscious relationship that I'm super lucky enough to be in. And with that relationship comes two extra kids, so the bonus kids, um, a 15-year-old girl and 13-year-old boy. So there's six of us now in this blended, beautiful blended situation. Uh, coach, author, speaker, son, brother, friend. Um, and I guess if I, you know, while I'm while I'm there, I, I've always identified as a traveler, an adventurer, and um, you know that took up a big chunk of my life, going to as many different countries as I could around the world. So that, there's me in a nutshell. What part of Australia are you in? I'm an hour and a half drive away from Melbourne. Melbourne's on the southeastern coast of Australia. I live in a small surfing community, a little town down here. Our local beach is Bells Beach. Um, Bells Beach was in, the, in that movie Point Break all those years I, ago. I was because I know the name. That's the only reason why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, um, it was the... Patrick Swayze Beach. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, man. So uh, that's where I live. And I live on a farm. It's a a working sheep farm. There's a farmer who runs his sheep here. And we live in the farmhouses. We're on 300 acres. Um, So yeah, it's it's beautiful, man. That's awesome. 
Okay. So I got to ask, cause I, I want to talk about the travel just a little bit here. Not, not, we're not going to go huge in it, but reading your book and, and looking into you have traveled. And it would be fair to say nomadic for at least part of your life. Yeah. For, for more than a decade, I was, I was definitely nomadic. Yeah. Where was your favorite place to spend time? Oh man, deepest in my heart is India, and but, it, but you know India is a, a big place, and um, you know India is kind of like a couple of hundred different countries all in one on one continent, you know. Mm. Uh, but yeah, India really made its way deep inside my heart, and and since then, this was back in the '90s when I spent most of my time there. But I've been going back pretty much every year since, and and we found a way prior to the pandemic and the restrictions, we found a way to. Um, make that a part of what we do. My partner and I facilitate leadership retreats up in the Himalayan mountains. So getting to go back to this particular one particular family that um, that adopted me, you know, back in the 90s and I've become a part of their family and, you know, have, as their kids have had kids and I've had kids and, you know, we've kind of grown up a bit together. So there's, there's a particular village in the Himalaya that's um, my second home. Yeah, so I, I reckon that's probably, but, you know, there's so many stunning places around the world for me there's two elements to you know what really gets me with a place one is the the natural beauty i'm a massive nature lover but also secondarily is that i i was always really interested in going to places with very different cultures to us i didn't want to go to somewhere that was kind of like where i grew up i was really drawn to going somewhere where the people were really different you know and the faith was different and the food was different and the language was different the way of living was different i was drawn to that so um yeah that's been kind of my my reasons to go to places is there just a, a favorite culture out there that just the people just overwhelm you you just loved being around the people yeah laos yeah just just north of thailand yeah the laotians were just so beautiful and peaceful and you know hospitable it was yeah I, as i think about it now i haven't thought about lao for a long time i haven't been there since the in the 2000s um, but i spent a month there and yeah the people are just gorgeous that's awesome so i i gotta ask you about this this short little tidbit where were you a fire dancer ah yeah 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 so i learned to fire dance um, when I back in my hippie days, I was wandering around, you know, the Indian subcontinent, Tibet, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, all that area, for a couple of years, and barefoot, uh, had dreadlocks halfway down my back, and a, and a beard kind of like yours, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, yeah, that's when I first started learning fire dancing, and then um, many years later, I was living in Taiwan. Uh, we were teaching English in a kindergarten in Taiwan to earn more money, and I was standing outside a pub one night just twirling fire for fun and a Taiwanese guy came up to me he said hey I'm a performance agent he said I can get you paid work doing that I said great so he got uh, my wife my then wife and I paid work fire dancing um, in front of department stores and stuff in Taipei and we were getting paid really good money to just stand on a stage and throw fire around <laughs> <laughs> I, I have talked to a lot of really interesting people and it's just some of the stories you run into is like fire dancing. That's just not something, you know, in, in the U S I would necessarily think of as like, Hey, this is a thing, right? People get paid to do that. Uh, it's yeah. always so interesting when you meet other people to hear some of the stories and hear some about the adventures they've been on. Uh, Jim, we're not going to go deep in during the first half of the show, but give me kind of a mile high low overview of what is your book about? And, and why did you write it? So the art of conscious communication, the idea was really about, you know, the more conscious we are of something, the more aware we are, right? So it was really just about being more aware of the communication itself. The reason I was wanting to write about communication is after thousands of hours of coaching, um, hanging out with people and, you know, being curious around this human experience, it became pretty obvious that we trip over a lot in communication and i did certainly in my marriage i was terrible at it um and and then as a coach so whether it's in relationship with our loved ones or whether it's you know as a leader with a team or interdepartmentally in an organization or even man like these days you know with with people who've identified with different politics and they're just shouting at each other 
you know, they've got a different idea on the way they think things should be. And they're just cancelling each other on Twitter and shouting at each other across these digital divides of difference, I say. And it's not evolving the situation, man. It's not helping anything. Um, you know, it's not making the world a better place when you're just kind of stamping your feet. So I think humanity, um, you know, could do with bringing our attention back to communication again. You know, we kind of take it for granted. Without communication, we wouldn't have even been able to evolve as a species, right? We weren't the fastest, fiercest animals on the, on the savannah plains. We needed to figure out how to socialise, how to work together as a team, as a community, and that can only happen with communication. So communication underpins the very fact that we've been able to evolve and that we're still here, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so, so I'm passionate about communication and I was writing the book generally, just conscious communication for, for anyone. And I engaged a book writing uh, mentor here in Australia. And she said to me, Jem, you need to pick an audience because you're writing too generally. And she suggested it. She said, I think men would do well to, to have this book written for them. Um, and that resonated with me. You know, I've been pretty passionate about, you know, the evolution and upgrading the cultural stereotypes of, of man. You know, I've been sitting in a men's circle for about 12 years um, and working closely with other men to share our experiences and, um, you know, hopefully reconnect back to our, our emotional availability, our emotional intelligence, our vulnerabilities, you know, to share and, and break out of this I'm an island thing and, and I'm on this journey on my own and my struggles are, are, are mine only. You know, I, I, I lived that for many years and it was pretty horrible. Um, so, yeah, no, I did, the, the idea to write for men resonated with me and funnily enough, I'm getting a lot of emails from women who are picking up the book and reading it and saying, thank you, I got a lot from it and then giving the book to their husbands and sons and brothers. And you know, I always get a kick out of it as a podcast aimed at men and, and it's funny because my marketing guy just told me he's like brent you, you got a niche down man you you're still too broad you, right we, we got to get this down a little more all men is a little bit of a big i was like <laughs> what are you at? right yeah That's, let me let me there will be links for it just just go get the book right okay. save yourself time i've been doing communications for a long time save yourself just, just, just go buy the book. Seriously. I, I, I don't push the books out hard very often, guys. You know that. Just go buy the book. Really. I, communication is so critical for every aspect of your life. Now, Jim, this is the heavy hitter question of the show. So if you got this when you're good, what is your favorite ice cream? What is my favorite ice cream? Wow. We just had good old fashioned chocolate chip last night. Yeah. You know, and that it, if it's a good quality chocolate chip, that's I'm going to have some of that. <laughs> Ice cream is one of those universal things. I like to, people always think it's funny when I ask about it, but seriously, it is, it is so universal. It yeah. may look a little different even in some countries than others, but pretty much there's ice cream everywhere and almost everybody can agree on ice cream. Man, do you know what I love about that is that, you know, I get asked about, you know, diversity and um, cross-cultural connection. And, you know, and I talk about the, the fundamentals that us humans have in common, you know, like we all need shelter, we all need food and water, we all bleed the same color blood, right? We all feel the pain of loss when a loved one dies. We have these things in common where we've got the fundamentals in common. I am now adding ice cream to that list. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, <laughs> I, for especially for uh, one place I find, right? Men connect, everybody can connect on ice cream. Men, all men can connect on fatherhood. It, it doesn't matter yeah. where you're from. All men can, can I, I have bridged conversations, like the most awkward conversations with people I don't get along with. So how's your kids doing? I, I noticed he was doing, oh yeah, yeah. Dads can talk kids. It doesn't matter what nation, what language. Yeah. We, we can talk about our kids and get, get into that. But there in ice cream, I can get almost every man in the same line on that one. Yeah, so, I love it. <laughs> I love it. And for, and for, you know, for men who don't, have kids yet um, who are not fathers they certainly will have something to say about their relationship with their father oh yeah yeah good and good bad or ugly there will there, there's 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 deep stuff in there you know and they have ideas about wanting to be a dad or questions about being a dad or if they're thinking about kids and uh i had one co-worker him and i just worked with him for years right he's about 12 years younger than i am 
And when I first met him, he was maybe 23. <laughs> like he was just that annoying, snotty, like the other, the other dads and I would start talking about, and he'd like bow out of the conversation. He's like, I want nothing to do with that. Right. Well, by interesting coincidence, we ended up working together for many years, actually in time for him to get serious about his girlfriend, get married and then have a child. And it was amazing watching the change in this person from this 23 year old straight out of college I met who didn't want anything to do with kids or anything. None of that nonsense. You guys are old ball to one day. He's like, Hey, Hey Brent, can I ask you a question? I was like, yeah, what's up, man? He's like, Hey, um, Katie's expecting. And I was like, congratulations, you know, right. Immediately. He's like, Hey man, that's awesome. He's like, I am a little, do I really need all? I mean, and we, he started asking me dad questions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And there was this instant transformation between him and several of the other members of the team because yeah. he started talking to us about family and about yeah. his concerns about becoming a father and, you know, yeah. doing research and stuff. And it was like watching him become this whole other person. It's like, Oh, look, another person has stepped into that. And here we are. Years yeah. of us being like, yeah, we're coworkers. We we kind of wave at each other and tolerate yeah. to all of a sudden we're buddies and we text and yeah, and, uh, yeah. It comes along. He's like, hey, he's doing this. Is that normal? Yeah, that's normal. It's okay. You know, <laughs> every kid eats their own feet. It's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, just, absolutely, man. The fundamentals, right? There is so much more that connects all of us than divides all of us. We just sometimes got to look right yeah completely and and this is not to say that we always need to agree on it on everything and and I, you know i'm actually I, I think the there's a lot of gold to be found in the conversations where we don't agree there's gold in there you know because if we all agreed if we all saw life exactly the same way and we all agreed you know that that's a very narrow bandwidth of of um you know scope for creative solutions, problem solving, you know, but the, the diversity itself is the pool, the, the bandwidth, the pool for us to solve the biggest problems. And to be able to do that, we need to be able to communicate and to be able to communicate, we got to be able to connect, man, you know? And so if, if, if I'm having a conversation with someone who's really different to me and has a very different perspective, if we can initially connect on things like fatherhood, you know, um, then, then we've got a foundation from which we can broaden our horizons and, and get on, you know, there's, there's a rapport that can be created and it's, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big proponent of disagreeing. In fact, I would think it would be really boring if we all agreed on everything. I, I think yeah. we are starting to lose the art of actually being able to have respectful, courteous conversations from differing opinions and being yeah. able to go, well, you know, Thanks for the conversation. I, I'm I'm not going to agree with you probably, but you know I respect your idea on it, and yeah. I appreciate that you took the time to share that with me. Uh, I love. I did an interview that I was just like I'm not even sure why this guy wants to do an interview on my show. I, I, I just could not for the life of me see why this guy wanted to come on my show. I knew immediately we we're like we are on opposite sides of the fence on so much. Right. He came on the show and he said, you know, I asked to come on the show because I knew you were going to disagree with me. Uh huh. He said, but I had seen your show and I knew we would at least have a real conversation when you did. Yeah. I was like, I think that's a thank you moment. <laughs> <laughs> a, little, real, yeah. a little uneasy. Yeah. You had an amazing TEDx talk and I'll link that in the description as well. That was a great, great TEDx talk. I love the TEDx platform. Uh, it just, it brings us so many incredible insights and snippets that, we wouldn't get otherwise. I love that platform, but it's obvious you're incredibly passionate about communication. Break down. And I mean, you've touched on it a little bit. Why, why is communication so important for everybody to embrace? Why put yeah. in the effort? What was the last bit you just said, Brent? Why put in the effort? Why put in the effort? Yeah, man. Look, I mean, without communication, not only can we not, manifest an idea into reality right for example einstein could have had all of his amazing 
you know, genius understandings of the mechanics of the universe. But if he couldn't communicate those ideas, it wouldn't have amounted to anything at all. You know, so communication is the the vehicle to manifest things into reality. But communication also is the conduit for us to um, be able to do anything together. And we need each other. You know, we, we cannot exist and survive in isolation. We need each other. I mean, there's the exception to the rule, you know, there's the monks who sit in a cave up in Tibet in the mountains and just live off a chapati a day, but someone brings them the flour <laughs> to make that chapati, right? Right. Um, yeah, we, we, we really, we, we need each other. And, you know, over the last couple of years of people being locked down and especially for people who live on their own, the isolation has become, you know, glaringly obvious that, that we suffer in isolation. Can we I need ask, connection. You know? Can I ask you something totally off script here? I didn't, Yeah, I, I have a run of show notes that I, I took notes, but I got to ask you something totally off script because I got to, I got to ask at this point. What do you think, right? In 2022, we have all this technology and I love the technology because you and I can connect, right? You're in Australia, I'm in the US, right? We would not be able to do this without the amazing powers of technology. However, what do you think in 2022 with all these different forms of communication and technology? Why, to me, it feels like we're communicating less. We're, we're posting pictures, but we're actually communicating less. What do yeah. you think? Do you think that or am I wrong? Yeah, it's crazy, man. We're, we're running this kind of global experiment on ourselves with these social media platforms and we don't know what the outcome's going to be. I've got a feeling it's not great, um, but it's happening. And, you know, the, there's, there's powerful people that are, that are way too incentivized by stealing our attention to, um, to stop these algorithms from, from creating addiction for people to be communicating. Mm-hmm in this in this false paradigm you know um it's yeah it's it's pretty crazy i look i i make a conscious effort to communicate in an old-fashioned way now if i think of a friend i pick up the phone and ring them hey man i was just thinking of you i just wanted to tell you i love you how are you you know um when 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 i when when someone asks me how i am they're going to get a real answer i'm not just going to say yeah i'm fine how are you you get a real answer from me. I'll tell you exactly how I am in that moment and what's going on for me. So if you're going to ask me how I am, be prepared for a few minutes. I you know, not, not just a throwaway comment. Um, you know, and look, I, I feel very lucky. My relationships, I, I, I invest time into my relationships. You know, I have, I've actually got it scheduled, dude. There's a great book um, by the late uh, Stephen Covey who wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Mm -hmm. And one of the habits is sharpen the saw, which means spend time on yourself, looking after, making sure you're okay. And he, he does a quadrant model. And quadrant two is things that are important but not urgent, right? Because we spend most of our time doing things that are important and urgent. It's like, wow, I've got to get this done today. Mm -hmm. Or we spend time doing things that are urgent but not important. Like when did it become important to scroll through Instagram for an hour? Right? But people spend, like you look at people now, they, they any spare minute, even people standing in the supermarket to do okay. their shopping and they're waiting for the cashier, for the register, they're waiting and they're on their phone. It's like, do you ever just stand there and look around, you know? Um, so I've got in my weekly schedule, I've got quadrant two time blocked in every week and when i go into quadrant two i'm doing things that are important but not urgent so i'm booking out trips for me and my my woman or for the kids i'm calling people who i normally wouldn't speak to people i care about to tell them i love them and see how they are you know i'm i'm investing in the relationships because the quality of our relationships equals the quality of our life you know i'm not just making this up this comes from research that's been done you yeah. know you so our relationships are really important and you know my friends know if they want to invite me to a party you better not invite me through some sort of facebook group because i'm not going to see it you want me to come to a party you better call me or text me you know? oh i'm not the only one thank goodness <laughs> so i miss a lot of parties man but i don't mind you know? i i've told people over and over again i do not have facebook messenger on my phone don't just yeah. if you want me to see it that is not the way I get on Facebook long enough to post whatever I need to, and and then I'm back out. Yeah, I actually have yeah. all of my social media apps in a folder on my phone labeled "Time Suck." 
<laughs> just to remind me when I reach for it, it's like, oh, wait, this is going to take me down the rabbit hole. And yeah, that's right. not that's beyond right. this. You know, people say, um, people say, oh, you know, you're so good at, you know, you think of someone and you just call them and they go, I can't do that because I haven't spoken to them for so long. If I just call them, it's going to turn into a, a an hour long conversation and I don't have a spare hour right now because we're all so busy. Right. Mm -hmm. And which is a, a perceptual thing anyway. But I, I said to them, you don't have to spend an hour. You know, I can ring some I haven't spoken to for a year. I can ring them and go, hey, Brent, I was just driving along, man, and I thought about you. I've got I only got a few minutes, but I thought I'd just pick up the phone, check in, tell you I love you and see how you're going. How's things, man? And, and I've already told you I've only got a few minutes. Right. And you're going to give me a snapshot of where you're at, and I'm going to say, awesome, have a beautiful day, see you later. And that was a five-minute phone call, but that person feels thought of they feel loved they they're like oh wow gem just called me out of the blue you know and i think it's better to do that than to not call them at all because i don't have a spare hour to catch up you know well and you can always lead off with the hey i i don't have a whole lot of time to talk right now but i was thinking about you and i want to get on your calendar let's let's pick a time what's what's a good day yeah let's, let's just sit down and talk for a little while yeah man that's right let's schedule that right. schedule let's it in you know put it because you know it's got to go on my calendar for me so it's like Hey, let's let's find a time that works for us. Yeah, but let's make it a priority. Let's schedule something now. No, no, no. Yeah. I'm it up. Schedule something now. Yeah. Your phone's in front of you. Yeah. Let's do it. Right. Yeah, yeah, let's yeah, yeah. That's right. Next. Yeah. So, so look, I think it's I think it's ultimately important, you know. And um, I'm I'm very grateful to be in a chapter in my life now. Uh, and I can't, I can't foresee this changing because I know too much now that I didn't know before. Uh, in terms of, you know, what's important. and But I'm very grateful to be in a chapter in my life now where I invest in my relationships and my relationships are, you know, beautiful and conscious and bountiful and nourishing. You know, very grateful because it hasn't always been like this. Okay. Well, guys, we've been getting to know Jim a little bit so far and kind of letting you get a feel for who he is. And second half show, we're going to actually start digging into his book, The Art of Conscious Communication for Thoughtful Men which I'm telling you, go buy it. I, I don't know how many times I'm going to say that, but just, just go buy it. Seriously. We're going to roll to our sponsor and we'll be right back with more from Jim. I'm calling on all men right now to stand up and stand against this horrific crime. It is estimated that over 300,000 children are being sex trafficked in the United States alone every single day. I want you to get on your social media. I want you to follow savinginnocence.org or fightforme.net. Both of these charities are working to end child trafficking in the United States and abroad. You can donate at www.thefallibleman.com slash shop and buy our inhuman trafficking merchandise and all proceeds will be given indefinitely to savinginnocence.org. You can also go to www.savinginnocence.org slash donate and donate directly to Saving Innocence. Men, it is time for us to fight and stop this horrible thing known as human trafficking. Guys, we're back here with Jim Fuller discussing the art of conscious communication for thoughtful men. And guys, it's an amazing book. You should read it. It will improve your communicative abilities so, so much. Jim, I got to ask, what purchase of $100 or less did you make in the last year that's had the biggest impact on your life? <sighs> and it can the, be most, the most recent one is a book. I'm reading a book by a woman called Bell Hooks. Um, she's from the US and the book is called The Will to Change. And it's a book about the patriarchal structures um, that, that define, you know, our lives, especially in the West. You know, it's talking about the US where she's, she was from. I think she passed only a few years ago. Um, and it's a remarkable book, man. Talk about good books. Bell Hooks, The Will to Change. Uh, I'm, I'm getting so much from it. Okay. Excellent. I always like to share something because you never know what's going to click with somebody, right? Someone may be listening and be like, Hey, that sounds like a great book. You know, you just never know what makes an impact for some people. Yeah. Me, I, I, I get this little, it's called thinking putty. Uh huh. I'm a fidgeter. Yeah. My, and I used to like bump my desk a lot when I was doing these interviews. And so right. now I fidget with this and man, it's made such a huge, cause I focus better that way and love it. 
it's, it's amazing what little things can help. So it's amazing. I, I always try to share that with people, what they can find, what can change their lives. Yeah. Now, awesome. We're going to get into your book a little more here, Jim. You say on the back of the book, just to start with in the description, that men are culturally indoctrinated to not communicate, which is part of why you wrote the book. Take us through that line of thought. Yeah, you know, um, look, I, I mean, I, I can understand that it's come historically, it's come out of necessity, you know, but this whole idea that we get our boys and say to them, man up, toughen up, harden up, don't cry like a girl. Can you believe we say that to our boys? Don't cry like a girl. Um, you know, and so we're teaching our boys that they have to toughen up and and maybe this was appropriate in the Great Depression, or maybe this was appropriate in World War II, and maybe this was appropriate back in tribal days where, you know, you could be attacked at any minute in your village and you had to, you couldn't be sitting around contemplating, um, you know, sensitively your emotional state. Maybe it was appropriate back then. It's different times, man. I really do believe that we don't need to be violent and violent either physically, emotionally, mentally, psychologically. We don't need to dominate each other and be violent as men to survive. Times are changing, right? And I'm a non-violent person and I'm doing just fine. Um, you know, and so I, I think we need to upgrade the, the brand of men. I think we need, I think it's time to get rid of the old you know, stereotypes to get rid of the patriarchal structures that, that teach our boys that they have to dominate weaker boys or women um, to, to be a man. It's just old and tired and I think we need to move on. So I'm just doing my bit to try and help that. Okay. I, I respect that. You know, this is one of those points where we're probably going to disagree a little bit on and that's fine. You know, people, uh, like we need to have these conversations. We do. Mm. You need to have open dialogue and be able to go, hey, okay, so that's yeah. not my spin, but that's another spin, which means I need to at least look at it, consider it, right? Yeah, well, you know, just to have the conversation, man. Look, I, I also, me and my partner explore and love exploring masculine and feminine energies in in functional ways, you know, and I and we love it. And it creates the polarity, the sexual charge between us when I'm in my in my masculine and she's in her feminine. And you know, we play with that and we play with old archetypes as well. The archetype of provider. Mm -hmm. I know this is a patriarchal archetype. I love it. It makes me feel um, like I've got a place in my relationship and, and a, as a father for me to be able to provide a life for my family is deeply ingrained in me. And I love that, you know, and, and my woman loves it too. She loves it when I call her my woman. <laughs> she loves that. <laughs> she calls me her man, you know. Um, so it's not just, I'm not just saying that, um, that men need to be all pacifists and sitting back and just completely chill and blah, blah, blah. You know, there's life, there's, there's energy, there's action taking and decision making and, and lots of cool stuff. So it's a, it's a, it is a really, um, it's a, a conversation that we could go in many directions and go as oh, deep as we wanted to go in, you know, I, I mean, I actually have to back down on this one just, just cause I, I could talk this for hours and <laughs> Uh, I think it's definitely conversations that we're needing to have. So, yeah, yeah. but I want to, I want to stay focused on your book because I think there's just so much, the hardest part about the show, honest to God, the hardest part about writing this episode has been trying to isolate just, just a fraction of what I took away from your book. Uh, yeah. It's like, oh man, which, what, what do I bring up? What do I share with my audience? And one of them was fairly early in the book that I want to share. And I want you to, go into a little bit and you talk about control influence and accept i really kind of want to start there because i think if you talk about these for our audience a little bit i think just learning this concept our you know processing this idea is a huge leap forward for a lot of us men yeah yeah so much man we we we, we spend arguably waste mm -hmm. so much of our energy um on things that we can't control or influence, you know, and we've all been, our resilience has been tested 
through the last couple of years. And, you know, so if our resilience is our energy reserve to be able to bounce back from adversity and not only to survive, but to potentially thrive through adversity and for resilience, we need energy, you know, and energy um, in any given day. I mean, we top up our energy with food and water and sleep, obviously, um, but energy is, is a resource and we can deplete our energy. We don't have we don't have energy to waste. I don't believe. Um, I mean, or you can waste energy if you want to, but you run yourself down. Worrying, stressing, doing anxiety or, or anger or frustration over things that you can't control or influence is purely just a waste of energy. So this acronym is um, cool, man. I didn't I didn't make it up. I, I cite the 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 people, the couple who came up with this acronym are cited in the book. But CIA is super simple and powerful. And I use it with all of my clients. I coach leaders across government and private and not-for-profit sectors. And and it's so simple, but deceptively simple. And anyone I share it with absolutely loves it. So C stands for control. I stands for influence. And A stands for accept. When I'm, when I'm stressing about something or you know, putting mental capacity into anything, I'm going to categorize it first. Is this something I can control? And if it's not, do I have some influence over it? And if I've got influence, how much influence do I think I've got? Is this something I've got 1% influence? Because if I've only got 1% influence, it only gets 1% of my blood, sweat and tears. If I think I've got 80% influence, it gets 80% of my, my concern, you know. And then there are things we can't control, can't influence straight into the accept basket. When something's in the accept basket, Brent, zero, nada. It gets nothing of me. Now, this is easier said than done, right? And it's a practice. So when we first start doing this, you might go, hey, I can't control that thing. I'm just going to accept it. And then an hour later, you notice that you're ruminating over it again. You go, ah, oh, shouldn't have happened, man. That shouldn't have happened. And you're going, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm there again. Accept, back in the accept basket. It's happened. It's in the past. Can't change it. And then two hours later, you, you're anger, angry or frustrated over it again, back in the accept basket. And what I've found, man, because I've been using this acronym for about 10 years now, mm -hmm. what I've found is that when we practice anything, the neural pathways start to wire together. You know, these neural triggers just fire really easily. When mm -hmm. I put something in the accept basket now, I don't think about it, man. I don't lie awake at night worrying about things I can't control or influence. You know, but that's taken 10 years. <laughs> but, the, you know, but the CIA, the CIA acronym is certainly a really handy tool to use. Well, it's very, very memorable, right? We all think of yeah. CIA, but, you know, it's, so it's easy to remember. Yeah, um, that's right. See, I, I've been working on for years, the whole, you know, letting go of what I can't control and uh, just, you know, accepting. It's like, okay, that's outside of my hands. But I never actually got that middle piece. And that was such an yeah. interesting insight for me to read it's like okay yeah i see where this is going oh wait influence I, I hadn't really thought about hey is there this middle ground where i i have a little bit of influence on it or not yeah uh and so that that just like really caught me it's like oh man that's uh yeah i hadn't considered that option i i was going you know one it, it's i ha can or i can't right yeah 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 and it's interesting you bring that up brent because the the influence piece in the middle we can cultivate our ability to influence, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and our ability to influence a given situation, if there are other people involved, largely, largely rests within our ability to communicate, you know? And the more consciously you can communicate and remember that communication is a sharing, right? It's not a telling. <laughs> it's, a, it's a making something common. The more consciously you can communicate, the more you can influence given situations. Now, I'm, I'm speaking with the presumption that you're a good person and you have good intent, right? So if you're someone who's a nasty person and you've got very bad intentions, I'm not talking to you. Go away. <laughs> I'm only talking to people with good intentions, right? If you've got the best intentions for the greater good of a situation, there, and you can improve your ability to influence a given situation, you can design the outcome. You can design the outcome. You can be powerful in your own life, you know, and as broad reaching as you want. If you're only interested in um, being a positive influence as a father and a partner, 
and to your immediate community, beautiful, do that. You can do it more effectively when you strengthen your ability to influence. If you want to go more broadly, just say you want to save the world, go for it. You're going to be better positioned to save the world when you can cultivate your ability to influence and that comes through more conscious communication. Guys, there's a lot of, there's a lot of value in there. Really, you guys need to take time and just spend, spend some time twirling that one around in your head. There is a lot to be said. And you certainly illustrate several, several stories in your book that super illustrate the value of strong communication. Uh, you, you have some amazing stories in the, your book from your travels where it's like, wow, okay, I can see where good communication skills really, really kind of matter sometimes. Uh, some of us take it for granted because we don't get too far out of our circle or wherever our comfort zones, but uh, your communication skills have been very useful for you just based on some of your stories. I want to venture into chapter 10 a little bit and chapter 10, you call the chapter deeper men to men communication. And since my audience is predominantly men, although I get several women who listen to my show too, uh, let, let's go there, right? This is an uncomfortable territory for a lot of men. And kind of goes into the heart of what I was talking about in the back of your book with men are indoctrinated not to communicate. So will you go into that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. It's um where to start, you know. So like you said, All you right, know, I ask a very pointed question on that one because I, I was having I was like, I'm not sure where to start this question. I yeah. know I want to talk about this portion of the book because there's just a lot that needs unpacked right there. Yeah, I think I think because we get taught because we get taught as boys that vulnerability is a weakness and potentially dangerous. We keep our vulnerabilities to ourselves. You know, and so we we dare not go too deep into um territories in conversations in communication with our mates, you know, because we just don't go there, right? So there's a surface level and we connect with sport. You know, we play football together and um, and then we go out and drink beer together and we, we have fun together and we laugh together. Uh, but when the conversation, unless we're drunk and, and then we kind of are a bit looser and we start going, I love you, I love you. And, oh, no, she, <laughs> she did this to me and that. And, but without the alcohol lubricant, we tend to kind of keep it at a certain depth. We don't venture any deeper. Um, and it's, it's interesting because when I was, um, an island in my life and I had my deepest, darkest anxieties that were completely, I, I had allowed myself to become completely emasculated. And this came out for me in, um, the deeply painful and, and depressing anxieties around sexual intimacy and dysfunctions. And it was, it was so embarrassing and I was so ashamed of myself i didn't tell anyone man i kept this as a secret torture for years um and it was it, i wasn't going to heal myself like that um and it was a combination of self-love self-acceptance self-work but also it was a combination of having the courage to speak out you know and to say to to friends initially and then more and more broadly to other men um, i'm struggling I'm really struggling. Um, and in having the courage to, to go deep and to talk about my vulnerabilities, the healing began, you know, and other men came up to me and said, oh, my God, you too? I thought I was alone because we, we sit there as a man looking at all these other men in our community going, they've all got there together. They've got it together and I don't. But it's not true. <laughs> We're all vulnerable. We're all human and, and humans are vulnerable. Um, so I think just the ability to, you know, to go deeper than just the surface level in a, in a conversation with a male friend is important, you know, and uh, like I said earlier, I've been lucky enough to sit in men's circle for about 12 years now and we sit around a fire, um, no booze, no weed, just water. We sit around a fire and we pick a theme, a meaningful theme, and we just talk and listen, you know, and to have that platform to be able to express what it is for you with no judgment, you know, is a really healthy thing to do. Uh, so, and culturally, most of our men don't do that. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm hoping to um, encourage men to just go a little bit deeper in their conversations with each other. 
I hit mute. Whoops. <laughs> now, guys, uh, we are to my least favorite part of the show. So if you're getting something out of this, be sure and click the like button. Leave us a comment. Or if you're on the podcast platforms, guys, leave us a review. That helps us keep making these shows. You know, guys, I hate this part. And if you're really into it, Guys, if you believe in what we're doing here, we have a Patreon account where you can go support us. Our supporters aren't rewarded with a bunch of junk. My supporters are rewarded because they become part of our inner circle because that's who I'm interested in. That's who I want supporting us. It's people who believe in the mission and want to help. Our supporters have direct impact on our content, the people we're talking to, the direction we're going, and they are such a valuable service to us. So if you believe in what we're doing, head over to Patreon or buy me a coffee. And you can become a full-time supporter there. Help us keep making these shows. And now we'll go back to the show because I hate this part of doing social media and podcast. <sighs> Sorry about that, Jim. I really do. <laughs> Dude, it's, ne- it's necessary, man. You've got to, you know, you need to find a way to keep this sustainable. This, The work you're doing, and I'm, I'm not just saying this to you, Brent. Um, because I like you. I'm saying this because I passionately believe in this. The work you're doing in terms of facilitating conversations like this is fundamentally important to the evolution that I'm passionate about. It's fundamentally important to us improving the state of play. You know, if we're not having these conversations, the only change will come from violence. And you know I'm anti-violence, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, man, you've got to find a way to be sustainable, You know, you need to, people need to buy you a coffee, (laughs) right? And I I appreciate that so much. Uh, I really do. It's it's that uncomfortable part because I just want to share with my community. Um, But let's keep going because there's just so much good stuff in this. In chapter 13, you say men are drawn, well, my question, men are drawn to actual processes. So I want to get into chapter 13. You outline a process in chapter 13 that is just a string of questions when questions are my favorite things in the world, actually. And it's why, who, what, how, pause, and share. And you actually yeah. outline a process to have better conversation. It's very actionable. I love that section of the book just because it creates a very actionable outline for people to start right here and now. Can, can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, look, I, I wanted to... Um, I really wanted to give tangible and easy to implement strategies, actual things that I can go and do. So I go, all right, Jim, I'm loving, I'm loving this chapter, man. And it makes sense, but what do I actually now do? So it was important for me to, um, to have those strategies in there. That, that process around communication is primarily it's for, for planned comms, right? So a conversation that you know is coming up that you're going to have to have. And I think it is a way to be more conscious around the communication itself. I, I believe the most important place to start is with why. Why am I having this communication? Now, it's not, it's not the first, usually not the first thing that comes to mind, unless it's simple communication like giving you directions. Just say you and I are meeting each other at a restaurant. I'm giving you directions. Why? Well, because I want you to be able to find the restaurant. You know? But for communication or conversations that are uh, more intricate than that, Understanding why is really important. You know, if I'm frustrated with my partner and I want to go to her and um, tell her what she did that frustrated me, then what's the point of why? Why am I having this communication? Because I want to tell her. Yeah, but why do you want to tell her? Well, because I want her to understand how she upset me. Well, why? But why do you want her to understand that? Oh, well, so that we can hopefully be more harmonious together. Ah, why do you want to be more harmonious together? Well, because I want her to know that I love her and I want her life to be as easy as possible when she's with me, you know. Ah, now there's the reason why you're going to have this communication. You're not going to tell her what she did wrong. That's not why you're doing it. You're going there because you love her and you're wanting a harmonious relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So if we start with the why in mind, then that informs how we put together and how we approach any piece of communication. Okay. I love the why question. I'm, 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 as my marketing guy tells me, the why behind the why behind the why. The yeah. is, a lot of times we stop at that surface level why. Well, why do we want to do it? Because I'm pissed and I want to share. Yeah. And why? Why are you pissed? Why do you want to share? Let's, let's dig a few more layers of why in there. 
Yeah. For what purpose is a great question to ask yourself for what purpose. And that can even, that can even let you know whether you should have the communication or not. You know, like if I'm, if I'm sitting there and I'm feeling frustrated and pissed off in a moment and I'm going, I'm going to tell that person. And then I'll go for what purpose, Jim, what's the outcome? What are you hoping to achieve right now? Well, I'm just pissed and they should know I'm pissed. Yeah. But why, for what purpose? And if it's just because that's how I'm feeling and I just want to express myself, then I'll make a, a, a more conscious decision around whether I should do that or not. Is it for the greater good? Is it going to improve the situation for anybody involved? You know, And quite often I'll say, yeah, nah, not going to help. So let me go and deal with my emotions in a more functional way. You know. Okay, guys. So I, I, let's, let, I want to break this down step by step and make sure I'm getting this because I want to make sure our audience is hearing this the way it's intended. So why do I want to communicate with my wife, right? We'll use my wife as an example. Why? I really got to drill down to why I need to go communicate with her or why I think I need to go communicate with her. The why behind the why behind the why, guys. Dig into it. Who? Well, that's an informed choice based on the why, right? So I know it's my wife I want to go talk to because that's how I got the why. It has to do with my wife. What is it I want to communicate with her? right? That's the what portion of it. What message do I want to communicate? Then I got to dig into how, how I'm going to do that to best inform her with the proper intention behind it. Is that correct? Yeah, man. And just even with the who part, the, the more, well, obviously the more you know someone, the more you know how they receive information. If you don't know someone very well, you're kind of doing a bit of guesswork. But if you understand how someone receives and processes information, you could communicate more effectively with them because there's different ways. Some people are big picture and they just want the dot point. You know, if I know someone is a, is a big picture dot point kind of person, I'm not going to go in there and sit there and do 20 minutes of detail going through every single page of the document with them. I'm going to lose them. You know, even if I'm a detail person, if I'm going in there and communicating in the way I prefer to be communicated with, without honoring their behavioral style, then I'm making it all about me, you know, um, or vice versa. If, if, if the person I'm communicating with pr likes to process information in a logical way with lots of detail, I'm going to schedule time to do that for them. So they can, so I'm communicating more effectively with them. You know, if I know that I'm communicating with my woman and she is beautifully emotional, I'm going to be um, communicating in a way that is honoring her, her emotional state. Right. Or if I'm, if I'm communicating with my brother, who's not very emotional and he's just kind of black and white, I'm just, that's how I'm going to communicate. So mm -hmm. the who part is really around it being intelligent, being sensitive to who it is and how they receive and process process information you know the what part like you said that's just what is the actual guts of this what what actually is it that I, i'm hoping to communicate to have understood um how like you said there's so many different ways to communicate if we were talking about it before you want to invite me around to your place for dinner don't do it through facebook <laughs> that that might work for your other mates but it doesn't work with me you know i'm not looking there for that so if, if, you know, how do you communicate? If the communication, if the conversation is potentially emotionally charged, you know, if it could potentially get a little bit heightened with emotion, then don't email it. Don't text it. It will be misconstrued 100%. Pick up the phone. Even better, say, hey, can I come around for a cup of tea? You know, if, if because so much of our communication is in the nuance of, tonality and 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 even energetics and vibration and body language and all this kind of stuff you know and so if if there's a slight chance that i could be misconstrued and you might get upset with me i'm going to pick up the phone i'm not going to email you because you will get upset with me you know you'll read right. it the wrong way so that that how part is really important and then pause is very literally that before you type the email before you pick up the phone before you walk into the room with your wife pause have a mindful moment Take a breath. Chill out. <laughs> I love when you put this in there. Serve, man. Come back to serving, right? Remembering that communication is about making something common. It's about a sharing. It's not a telling, right? I'm here to serve the communication, the greater good right now. So I'm going to pause. I'm going to put my ego to the side a little bit. 
loosen your grip. And we hold on so tightly to the way we think things should be. You know, we're like, no, 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 it should be like this. And I'm determined to prove that it should be like this. You're holding on so tight. Just loosen your grip a little bit, right? Ego, it's okay. We're safe. There's no lion coming to eat me right now. <laughs> it's just a conversation, right? So pause and then share rather than tell. You know, it's not about telling. It's about sharing. So, yeah, that's a process I, I, I designed for the book, man. Guys, that pause part, please pay particular attention to that. That pause part will save your marriage. It will save friendships. It will save your job. I live on that pause with, with communication my work. I can't tell you how many emails are IMs I have written for work that I typed it all out and I stopped and I reread it. And I took a breath and I backspaced 95% of the message. <laughs> yeah. I typed it again. Yep. Took a breath, looked at it, deleted most of the message. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank God for the pause, right? Pause will save you. Please pay attention. We tend to react in, for men who do not like to pretend we're, who, well, let me rephrase that. For men who like to pretend we aren't very emotional, we snap react in the heat of the moment so often. Take the pause, please. Yeah, take the pause, yeah. Save your job, save your marriage. No, yeah. you really should not tell your wife what you think of her mother's cooking if it's that bad. <laughs> no, right? For what purpose, right? Exactly. For what purpose am I about to tell my wife how bad her mom's cooking is? Is it going to change anything? Is it going to is it going to make her cook better? Is it going to mean that we um, you know, we don't have to go around there once a month for the roast dinner on a Sunday, you know? Yeah. Or is it going to mean that I'm sleeping on the couch? Yeah. <laughs> Now, Jim, we talk a lot about mentoring and fatherhood on this channel. And so there's a lot that can go into that. I want to get into chapter 20 a little bit where you talk about creating the next generation of conscious men. You have two teenage boys and then you have a blended family, right? So you got the boys and then you've got your partner's kids too. Yeah. So how as mentors, fathers, father figures, do we teach the next generation how to communicate better, especially as we're struggling with it ourselves, right? which makes it a harder chore to try and teach somebody else when it's something that we need to create and fix in our own lives. Yeah. How do we start that process effectively? Man, early on, I, I, I set up a foundation in terms of communication with my boys where I said to them, boys, if you've ever done something and, you th and you're kind of not sure whether it was a good thing to do or not, if you, if you want to come and tell me about it, if you want to come and talk about it, I promise I won't get angry with you right? There might be consequences, but we'll talk through them together. But I want you to know you can talk with me about anything. Now that's kind of worked to a large degree. My boys tell me about pretty much everything. And I know necessarily they'll have some things they keep to themselves because they need to feel autonomous and independent and that they're, you know, the master of their own destiny, etc. But the bigger stuff, you know, the, the questions they have about life and anxiety and, and or, or alcohol or w girls or, you know, or the bigger questions that they have about life, they come to me with, you know. So I'm happy about that. They're also normal teenage boys. You know, they, they come home from school and you say, how was your day? And they go, uh. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one kind of grunt. And, and so sometimes I'll dig a little deeper and I'm like, you know, I'll just invest the time to ask more questions, you know, about where they're at. And sometimes I'll let them be in their teenage boy uh, bit, you know, because that's just where they're at. But at least they feel safe to be able to talk about anything with me, you know. And I think it's about, um, yeah, it's about them feeling psychologically safe. I didn't feel psychologically safe to talk with my dad about stuff, so I didn't. I didn't, there was no way I was talking with him when I was a young teenager and I was piercing my ear and smoking weed and, um, you know, pinching booze out of his bar and getting drunk and stuff. I didn't tell him any of that, you know, or my anxieties about, you know, how do I be a man or, you know, what steps do I take with a girl or all this kind of stuff. I just figured it out on my own because I didn't feel safe enough to talk with him about it, you know. So I think it's important to create an environment with our kids and with our boys and girls, um, but, you know, in the context of this book, with our boys for them to feel safe, to talk about the, the things that they're not sure about. Psychologically safe. That's, that's one of those things we separate out. Uh, 
and, and I had a great conversation with a guy named Michael Unbroken. He runs a, runs a trauma recovery group. But uh, Michael had one of those lives. So you're just like, wow, you're still alive. That's amazing. Um, but it's not something that most of us think about very often, right? The, the psychological safety in communicating with our children, right? We, we have this idea of this is how it works. This is the way we were raised, right? And we either like that or we don't like that. We pick up our own ideals, but we don't think about creating that psychologically safe space necessarily, because it's, it seems like little things from an adult perspective. Sometimes I have to work really hard. I have a seven-year-old and a 10-year-old daughter and I have to, with working a full-time job and having a business on the side, you know, I schedule in time to spend with them to make sure I'm spending time with my children, uh, good time, like quality time, no mm. phone, stuff like that. No business meetings, no calendars, no emails, but I have to catch myself every now and then because they're trying to show me something or they're something's got them upset. I'm like, it's a nothing. What are you freaking out about? It's like, oh, <laughs> stop, stop right No, That's not the right answer. <laughs> yeah. Right. We don't think about that because we look at it from an adult's eyes instead of yeah. looking at it from their eyes. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? You know, I, I think we are better placed. We're more effective at helping someone whether whether it be our children or someone on our team or a friend helping someone move from where they are to where they need to be you know and that can be literally physically or it can be emotionally or psychologically we're we're better placed to be able to help them move if we meet them where they're at first mm -hmm. if we if we honor where they're at first if we um, validate where they're at first because if you sit with your kid and they're 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 trying to express to you what's going on for them in that moment. And, and if we dismiss it, it's harder to say, come on, just come over here. You can be happy again if you come this way. They, they're like, you still don't get me. But if you get them, if you get into that moment with them and you're like, wow, and you really get them, then they feel seen. They feel understood. There's been communication. There's been a sharing of where they're at. And then you're like, hey, how about we go over here? You know, so yeah, it's it's a good point that you bring up, Brent. You know, to remember in that moment to validate. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big proponent of trying to get on their level, especially with mm. my goals. I'm I'm a physically larger man. I mean, I'm not the biggest guy in the world, but I'm, I'm a pretty good sized individual, and so yeah. I I make a conscious effort to try and get down at their level when I'm communicating with them. Yeah, whether they're sitting or bringing them up to me, or but I try and get eye to eye with them. So yeah. I'm not looking down just because it helps me to pull myself into their space. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so important, you know, and I think it doesn't take quantity of time, you know, it's like you said before, you said it beautifully quality time doesn't mean quantity. You don't have to lie on the floor and build Lego with your five-year-old for two hours but if you build Lego with your five-year-old for 10 minutes and they've got all of your attention, 100% quality, your phone is switched off, you are really seeking to understand where they're at mm -hmm. and you're, you're not trying to show them how to build an, an amazing Lego thing. You're with them as they're, as they're in the moment of finding this piece that goes here. And when you can bring yourself to be present in that moment, five or 10 minutes of quality time with your kids is worth hours of wasted time while you're scrolling on your phone and you're like, yeah, I'm hanging out with my kids, you know? So what is next for Jim Fuller? Oh, life's pretty exciting. <laughs> life's pretty exciting. We're actually, um, the, my team and I are branching out into your neck of the woods, man. Well, your country into, into the U S I'm really excited about that. We're building a, uh, an online communication course for the modern leader. So post-pandemic leaders and in this changing world. And so we're building a communication course for leaders, which is really exciting. If anyone's interested to hear more about that, um, just shoot me a message. Go to my website, gemfuller.com, and then just reach out and, and shoot me a message. Um, so that's that's really exciting because I'm going to be able to help more leaders with that. Yeah, there's the website there. Thank you. Just go contact me. There's a contact form and, and it'll come through my team and it'll get to me. Um, what else is exciting? Uh, I'm already thinking about the next books. 
that's exciting. I'm super excited to be running our retreats again. We've been on pause, obviously, with two years of being locked in Australia. So in 2023, we're back in the Himalaya. We're back in Bali, um, you know, and potentially some other places. So that's super exciting. Um, oh, my partner and I are, are fitting out a commercial property at the moment. We're moving into some, stu- we're building some studios together. Yeah. So um, I won't have a, a green screen behind me. I'll have a, a nice, <laughs> a nice studio. I, and my, yeah. I think I looked it up. You said uh, you found a space next to her yoga studio, right? Yeah. So she's Pilates and she works with, um, she works with um, pregnant women and postnatal women and babies. That's her jam. <laughs> Uh, she's a doula so she's a birth support worker and a birth educator she does you know educates around the birthing process and that's her her professional world and so she's going to have studios uh, and then nestled in the middle of them is is my studio so i'm really excited man i'm I'm pretty fascinated with energy and energetics and and vibrations and so um, to be nestled in the in the midst of all this beautiful female mother young child life energy um is exciting for me and she's on the on the other flip side of that she's actually really excited her and the women that she works with they're really excited to have this masculine energy in the heart of the building um knowing that i'll be sitting in my studio doing the work that i do and um you know coming from a grounded place of reasonably functional masculine um doing my best anyway so yeah it's it's going to be a really beautiful blend that's very exciting man that's very cool i I was looking on your facebook and it's like, oh, 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 wow, yeah, okay, that's cool. Uh, I always, as I'm digging into my guests, it's like, oh, yeah, stalk the Facebook, right? You got to stalk the social. Media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People, but that's yeah. very exciting. So, is the website the best place to connect with you? Uh, if you just want to follow me and and uh, see the content that I put up, I post content pretty much daily on on Insta. Um, a- anywhere, Insta, Facebook, and LinkedIn. I'm just Gem Fuller, J E M F U W L E R. So you can follow me there, and I'll um, and I'll keep uploading stuff that I think that I'm hoping will help you. That's the reason I post it. It's funny, man, with the the posting stuff. You know, I because you can be very self conscious and go, oh, you know, am I sounding like a dick? And am I sounding stupid? And should I be posting this? Or you know, you can have that chatter in your head. Mm-hmm. There, there was this one time, man, where I did a, a video blog on death, and it was after my brother had died. My youngest brother died on his motorbike, and mm-hmm. it was after that. And I did a video blog on death and how it can inform us as to how to live, right? Because death's inevitable. We are all going to die and we don't know when, but it's definitely happening to all of us. But people avoid the topic. And for me, um, the pain of grief and losing people that I love has really helped me come back into this carpe diem idea of seize the day because it could be your last, right? And so I did this post on death. I got a phone call two weeks later from a woman who knows my mother. And she rang me up and she said, I just wanted to say thank you for posting that video blog because we had a friend whose wife died three years ago and he went into hiding. He wouldn't answer our phone calls. He wouldn't see anyone. He went into isolation of depression for three years. He saw your video post and he's come out. He picked up the phone and he's reached out to us and he wants to connect back into his community again because of that video post. And I just went, wow, you know what? If I help one person with a post, I'm just going to keep on doing it. And you cop a bit of hate. People go, oh, you you know, people judge you and, and, and hate on you regardless. But you know what? I'm not going to let that stop me, man. I'm just going to keep posting stuff that I hope helps. So if you want to follow me online, do that. Um, if you want to reach out to me, go through the website. If you want to grab the book, Amazon, Booktopia. Oh, man, the Audible. The Audible book's almost ready. Yeah? It's in, yeah, the post-production's been done. We've recorded it. Um, I narrated it, so you're going to have Did to you? put up with this Aussie accent. That's awesome, dude. That's the best way to do it. Right now. <laughs> yeah, um, and that's now gone to the publisher. So I'm hoping um, if you prefer to listen to your books rather than read them, you'll be able to get it on Audible in the next few weeks, hopefully. I love Audible. It lets me listen to more books. That's, yeah. I, I I stayed away from it for years. I discovered Audible in 2020 when I was getting the Fallible Man started. And I was like, how did I miss this for so long? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's yeah. so much easier to keep up with my reading. So yeah, that's, that's right. I, you can devour books. Huh? Back in the day when I used to drive to work, 
mm-hmm. um, you know, before being locked down and bringing it all online, I would be able to devour a couple of books a week. Oh, yeah. you know, and podcasts. It's a little bit different now because because of um, the last two years we haven't I haven't been driving anywhere near as much. Um, but anyway, you know it'll be on Audible. So that's very exciting, man. I'm glad you did it yourself. I really think it actually adds a great deal when the author does it because then you were talking earlier about you know there's so much voice inflection and stuff like that is valuable valuable to communication. Yeah, and yeah, you're absolutely. Actually hearing it the way the author intended it to come across. And I think that yeah. adds value. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this you've read the book, man. There's, my stories are in there. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, if someone else was trying to tell my story, they, they kind of wouldn't be able to do it, I didn't yeah. think, you know. Absolutely. Guys, on, honestly, God, besides where he mentioned, there's also on my website, it goes to Amazon. Go get a copy of this book. Seriously, like get a copy, give it to your friend, give it to everybody you know. This will help you. Communication is so, so important. And it is everywhere in your life. Your children, your significant other, your coworkers, your friends, your parents, your siblings. It doesn't matter. It's everywhere. It is life. And there is so much value to take away from Jim's book. Please, please consider going and getting it. It will stay up on my library. Get it on Amazon. Get it on his website. We'll have links for all that in the description and the uh, show notes for the show on all the platforms, YouTube and podcasts. So guys get you a copy of the book, Jim, thank you so much for taking time to be on the show today and hang out with us and visit with us a little bit and share guys as always be better tomorrow because what you do today, we'll see you on the next one. This has been the fallible man podcast, your home for everything, man, husband, and father. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a show. Head over to www.thefallibleman.com for more content and get your own Fallible Man gear.